So good morning, everybody. I'm Steve Handelman. I'm director of the Center on Media, Crime, and Justice at John Jay College. And on behalf of President Jeremy Travis, uh, who could be here today, and Provost Jane Bowers, I want to welcome you to the eighth annual Harry Frank Guggenheim John Jay Symposium on Crime in America. Um, those of you who have attended previous symposiums will know that the lights that are in store for you over the next day and a half. Uh, we've been doing this, uh, as the name suggests, for eight years. And what's interesting is that in the, over those eight years, a constant refrain that we've seen through all these conferences has been the fact that um, uh, crime has been going down or declining or stabilizing uh, over that period. And people uh, throughout our conferences have worried, well, how are we going to get Americans interested in the underlying issues of criminal justice if there's no huge crime spike to get them really excited and focused on it? Well, um, as most of you know, this year has been a year when people have begun to focus in a really, ordinary Americans have begun to focus in a really serious and intense way on violence. Um, and you only mention the names of Newtown, Aurora. Um, people have suddenly realized that um, whatever the rates or the statistics show, that violence can strike at the strangest and most awkward places. Um, not just in the inner cities, but in um, an elementary school, a movie theater, a shopping mall. And people have begun to wonder again and worry whether um, we are facing uh, problems that we thought we'd overcome um, over the last few years. But what's interesting about the new focus on crime and justice is that it coincides with a really interesting movement that's been, those of you who've been following the issue will know about for the last several years, where people have said, well, uh, we've had a tough on crime agenda or paradigm for the last decade or so. And what's, what we, what's resulted is that we have um, the highest per capita incarceration rate in the world. Uh, we've got young people um, and adult offenders coming out of prison and coming right back in, in a cycle of, um, of a prison to community to prison pipeline that in many of our communities across America has destroyed families, destroyed communities, even though the majority don't feel it and don't notice it. And people have been saying, where's our money gone? And that's coincided, of course, with our economic crisis. And people say, are we getting um, value for the money that we're spending? And the movement, um, which has been sort of grouped under the, the easy headline of smart justice, has been to look at things that work, what we know works, what doesn't work, and try to apply them in a much more rational and sane way to um, our criminal justice challenges. And we've just had an election, we've had the re-election of the, of the Barack Obama administration, and all those things coming together suggest to us that this is a good moment to look at the concept of smart justice, which is our theme this year, and to look at some of the things that work in, in, in smart justice look at the bipartisan uh, political climate for getting it there, and to find out whether it actually makes sense to proceed along that track. And of course, we want to define what is smart justice to begin with. So we have a really exciting array of panels and panelists here to discuss as many aspects of that um, uh, issue, of that topic, as we can fit in over the next two, two days, or day and a half. And those of you who are um, have the stamina to stay through all of those panels, I'm sure will come out with a um, a whole new approach and interest and realization um, uh, of what the, what, the, what the challenges are. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, um, the program before we go on to our keynote, but um, I did want to make another point that what's important to us and has always been important in the um, Guggenheim Symposia is that, and what makes it unique really in the, the criminal justice calendar around the country, is that we believe that the media and the journalists are a key part of any discussion about criminal justice futures. Um, and not just as uh, a group or um, uh, uh, a class of uh, players in the criminal justice system that stands outside, does a few stories and moves out again, but as an integral part of the discussion that makes um, uh, our debates around the country much more meaningful and that um, helps Americans understand a lot more about what's at stake uh, in the criminal justice challenges that we have today. 
And this year we've got a particularly great crop of journalists from around the country who've been chosen as John J. H. F. Guggenheim reporting fellows. Um, there are too many to introduce individually, but I'd like, we have 17 uh, here this morning. I hope they're all here, and I'd like them all just to stand up and be recognized. Welcome to the... And we also have our, um, those of you who will be with us uh, later on uh, for other activities, we also have the winners of our John J. Uh, H. F. Guggenheim X Prize for Excellence in Criminal Justice Journalism. Uh, I think they're here, Shane Bauer and Cindy Chang. I uh, know Shane, Shane is here. And I think Cindy, and Cindy may not have come yet. So welcome to you all. I mean, this is going to be a kind of interactive uh, virtual debate. Uh, we're going to be streaming this uh, on our site, The Crime Report. And um, throughout, this is a, a conference really where we don't want to just talk at you, but we want to have your involvement as well. So we're, we're making a big point when our panelists come on, when our speakers come on, that we'll try to stop them about um, 10 or 15 minutes ahead of schedule so we can get a lot of questions and answers in and have a kind of discussion going. Um, the, only, the only other thing that uh, I need to say is to say a special thanks to the people who made this uh, this year's Guggenheim once again a success. Uh, I want to make, say a special thanks to Joel Wallman of the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation, uh, who's helped us. Joel? Joel hates to stand up. Uh, also, a special thanks to the Ford Foundation and the View Center on the States, uh, Public Safety Performance Project. I don't know if they're here yet, but um, I'll be talking about them and to them during the day. And I also want to make a quick plug. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen um, the announcements, is that we're having a really fantastic event tonight, a special dinner, where we usually award um, our annual journalism prizes to our winners, and they'll be there. But is, this is a dinner that honors David Simon of The Wire with a really new award we're calling the Justice Trailblazer Award, uh, to honor the career achievements of a media person uh, for his or her contribution to the debate on criminal justice. So I hope um, if those of you who are here would like to come, it's a, a ticket-only event. Um, we'll be, the tickets will be available at the door. Uh, we're just about full, but we can always find room for more. So I'll talk again. I'll do a couple more plugs about that during the day. Okay, so let's start with our program. Um, and it's, I'm particularly uh, honored to introduce today our keynote speaker, um, Loretta Lynch. Was the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York. Um, she was appointed by President Barack Obama as U.S. Attorney in 2010, and this is the second round for her. She was uh, in a similar capacity um, between 1999 and 2001 as an appointee of President Bill Clinton. She is responsible as U.S. Attorney for overseeing all federal and civil investigations and cases in Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island as well as Nassau and Suffolk counties on Long Island. She supervises the staff of approximately 170 attorneys, 150 support personnel, and she's really been an all-purpose prosecutor. She's uh, prosecuted narcotics, violent crime, white-collar crime, public corruption uh, cases throughout her career. And in January, just last month, Attorney General Eric Holder appointed her chair of the Attorney General's Advisory Committee of U.S. Attorneys, where she's been a member since 2010. So please join me in welcoming um, U.S. Attorney Loretta Lynch. Thank you. Lower the microphone as I always have to do. <laughs> Hopefully not too low. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. You have a great day ahead of you. Let's get it started off right. So I want to thank you for that great introduction, Steve. Uh, and in particular, thank you for having me here this morning. John Jay is an excellent institution. It's one that's long been a friend to the Eastern District, both in educating many of our attorneys and staff and also in participating in a lot of the programs that we support. I was looking over your agenda for this symposium. It's really quite impressive. And it captures much of the thinking that is going on in law enforcement today. And I think Steve really encapsulated it 
when he talked about essentially our efforts over the last years leading to an incredibly high incarceration rate, but at every step of the day, those of us who are working in the law enforcement system have to continually ask, are we really safer? And if whether we are or not, with the caveat that there's always going to be an underlying level of crime and discontent in our society, how do we keep ourselves safer? How do we deal with the challenging issues of the day? Crime in New York City is indeed down statistically, but there are still entrenched hot spots or pockets of crime, certainly that I see in my district every day, in every one of the counties that I supervise, be it those of the city or be it those of Long Island. How do we deal with the essential question of ensuring fairness in the system of laws that set us free? And for those of us who manage offices, how do we grapple with these issues in a time of budgetary constraints and ever-shrinking resources? It is true, I have 170 lawyers, although we are significantly down from our highest staffing level. How do we keep the public safe, the eight million people who go to sleep every night relying on us with fewer resources, fewer people, and yet more to do? Well, I think one thing that the past several years of criminal justice strategy, theory, and practice have shown us that arresting more people or building more jails is not the ultimate solution to crime in our society. In fact, if there's one thing that I think we've all learned is that there is no one ultimate solution to crime in our society or to the difficult issues that we've outlined and that you will be discussing today. And if justice, the overall concept, not just the law enforcement hammer that I wield, but if justice is really about the protection of the people of this society and ensuring that they have the freedom to grow and live and believe, then we all have to expand our vision beyond the four corners of an indictment to the issues of prevention of crime, to prosecution, yes, and the increasingly important issue of the re-entry of those back into society that we sent away for so long. Indeed, this three-pronged approach, or the three-legged stool, as the department tends to call it, that supports our criminal justice system, is the hallmark of this administration's anti-violence strategy, which we in the Eastern District have embraced. And this is not to say that we naively push after-school programs at the expense of removing dangerous people from our communities. That continues as well. But when I review my office's gang portfolio, which sadly is as robust as it was when I was a junior prosecutor in the 1990s, I see a double tragedy. I see young men and boys, mostly African American and Hispanic. I see the lives that they take, but I also see the lives of their own that they so cavalierly throw away. And when we sit down and talk to these young men, we realize they don't intend to live beyond 10 more years anyway. And when the 15-year-old sees gang life as a viable career, literally as the job to which he aspires, and he thinks he's only gonna live until 21 anyway, there is more wrong there than can be fixed with just a prison term. Now we will provide the prison sentence because we have to protect the community. But what of the aftermath? When these young men and increasingly young women who are caught up in street violence return home, what have we put in place to keep them out of their previous life? And this is not just, again, a view that we're gonna coddle the criminal or support them, but we have to support the whole community because lower recidivism rates mean fewer victims. It means a safer community. It means a safer city for us all. And it means, hopefully, hopefully, with some of these young offenders breaking the cycle of violence and preventing their children from being pulled up into it as well. Now, all of us in the criminal justice system, including those of us who cover it from the press, have a role to play in this three-pronged approach. But how have we in the Eastern District worked to broaden our focus? How have we carved the three-legged stool out of the monolith of the criminal justice system? And more importantly, how do we maintain that focus in a time of budget cuts, 
shrinking resources. And to answer the question posed by your theme here, how do we work to dispense smart justice? Well, one important way is that we support the Department of Justice's grant program through feedback and input, and also working with grant recipients in the community who are working on high school education programs, job training, training programs, and the like. I was looking at your agenda and I was delighted to see that Mary Lou Leary is gonna be addressing you tomorrow morning from the department's Bureau of Justice Assistance, Office of Justice Programs. She'll give you a lot of insight into how those grants are currently awarded and how we are trying to focus them on areas that have shown not just the need, but the potential to use them well. Through grants, through training, the department supports more cops on the street, we try and strengthen community courts, and we try and, and help programs that strengthen families because so many of our young offenders come from a place where there is no other support but the life of violence. In the office, through our student intern program and our moot court program, we reach out to students from some of the most challenged areas in our district in the hopes of showing them a face of the law that wants to lift them up, not lock them up. And it's not just criminal prosecutors that are working with this perspective. Within the department, in the Civil Rights Division, recently suits have been brought seeking to break the school to prison pipeline in many states of the Deep South, and more are in the works. Because we have seen that in an effort, truly, in a well-meaning effort to keep our schools safe, the disciplinary system that we have imposed takes young boys, particularly young minority boys, out of the classroom and into the penal system at a higher rate than other students and at a detrimental impact to both their learning and their lives. Of course, we continue in the realm of prosecution, but there we try and focus on targeted prosecutions. There are, of course, the core law enforcement areas in which we work, national security being one of the most important, narcotics, organized crime, white collar fraud, public corruption, in all of those areas, we ensure that there is a demonstrated federal interest that fits our priorities. Where we can, we combine our forces with our state and local law enforcement partners to leverage all our resources in several of those areas. And when a new threat emerges, such as the recent rise in prescription drug abuse, we pool information and strategies to determine the best way to combat this problem. I'll just take a minute and tell you that I think our prescription drug initiative is actually an excellent example of how we attack this growing problem on many fronts. We are, of course, at a point where prescription drug abuse contributes more to overdose deaths than many of the, of the prohibited narcotics that certainly I and my colleagues spent years prosecuting as young narcotics prosecutors. And what we do in the Eastern District of New York, in conjunction with the five district attorneys in our district, is we have come together to share information and to share law enforcement intelligence, to locate the hot spots and to see who can best build the case. Is this best suited for federal resources? Is it a matter best left to the state law enforcement? Now, of course, we also prosecute the offenders and we have over time prosecuted not just those who traffic in prescription drugs, but the medical professionals who overprescribe as well. But what we've seen in that area is that these offenders, more than some others, often have substance abuse problems themselves. And where appropriate, we support the recent program developed by some of the judges in the Eastern District, where nonviolent defendants with substance abuse problems that have contributed significantly to their offense are offered the opportunity, working with the court and the probation department, to enter rehab and other support programs in the hopes that it will ameliorate their sentence. This is a new program. It has moved from the pilot stage to recently graduating the first few of its successful entrants. And we look forward to working with the court to find ways to provide not just prosecution, but treatment for those who find themselves caught up in this spiral. But the prescription drug epidemic begins long before I ever arrest a soul Thus, we are also looking to training medical professionals on the problems in this area as well. 
We're offering training on the dangers and the issues of prescription drug abuse to the medical schools in our district. That's just one initiative that we've come up with to try and deal with this problem. Now we also use statistics, we use data. We are all awash in numbers, I know. But we try and locate the hot spots of violence in our district. Those of you who cover New York, however, know that you don't need a major study to know. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. In terms of looking at the hot spots of violence within the Eastern District, one that particularly stands out, as anyone who covers New York knows, is the Brownsville area of Brooklyn. Roughly a mile in scope, it has one of the highest incarceration rates in the city. Almost 82% of the young men of that, area, of that community end up in some sort of penal institution. The residents there speak vividly about their fears of guns, gangs, the violence associated with the narcotics trade. And even though crime in New York City has been trickling down and trending down very successfully, violence in Brownsville is up. Shootings in particular are up, with children often the unintended targets. The department seeks to support the Brownsville community's based crime prevention efforts, such as its youth court and its GED training. And we also work with local law enforcement, with the DA's office, with the 73rd Precinct, to decide where to best focus our federal law enforcement resources, in particular, which offenders fit within our firearms and our gang program. And it is in Brownsville where we also support a reentry program that draws upon our office as well as that of the Brooklyn District Attorney, as well as educational, job training programs, and life skills programs designed to provide an avenue away from crime from those offenders that are returning to the community. I was actually delighted to see that James Brodick of the Brownsville Community Justice Center is one of your panelists later today. And I guarantee you will find his story compelling. Now, of course, the issue of the day, at least the issue of the headlines, is firearms violence in our society. And this issue, which has rightly, in my view, been described as a public health crisis, as well as a law enforcement problem, it manifests itself differently in different parts of the country. But no area is immune. Here in New York, the shadow trade of firearms between and among gang members and within the drug trade escalates violence to an alarming degree. As the families of every toddler shot in Brownsville or every innocent bystander caught in gang crossfire on Long Island can tell you. And when we look at the president's recent, recent initiative on firearms, we see the same broad perspective that informed the initial anti-violence strategy. A recognition that this problem must be attacked on all fronts, from research to prevention, yes, to prosecution and community support. A recognition that if we wait until the shooting is over and the smoke is cleared, we are entering this problem far too late. And a recognition that everyone has a role to play in safer communities, in protecting our children, in smart justice. Now institutions like John Jay and the Vera Institute, whom you, I also will, you also, will also hear from today, have long been at the forefront of research and analysis and will be key in these efforts ahead. And we in law enforcement stand prepared to do our part as well with initiatives that target serious offenders, prevent the acquisition of firearms by those who should not have them, and punish those who flout those laws. But we are not the only parties in this effort to dispense smart justice. As I said at the beginning of my remarks, all of us, including the press, have a role to play. The role of the press is extremely important to those of us in law enforcement. It is, of course, through the fourth estate that the public is informed not just of what we do, but how we do it. And that message is more important than ever. The current issues of the day, be they terrorism and national security, white collar crime, or gun violence, are not simple issues. They deserve the best of the analysis that the press can bring to bear. Now, of course, we recognize the press is under tremendous pressure as well. The challenge for a press dealing with a 24-hour news cycle 
as well as the persistent drumbeat of ratings, is to go beyond the easy and the facile news story to the larger discussion, for which there never seems to be enough time or space. But we urge you to look beyond the initial headline, to push back against the pressure to make everything bleed, even if that's all you see at first. And in particular, we urge those of you in the press not to write the ending before you write the story, not to choose the villain and the hero and then have everything flow from that, but to explore the nuances and the differences, because I will tell you that in my world, someone who's a perpetrator today can be a victim tomorrow, and they have just as sad a story, and it deserves to be told as well. Now I know there is often a tension between law enforcement and the media, and this is understandable because we do have different roles to play, and we do have different obligations to meet. But this tension need not be the governing factor in our interactions. We can rise above it. We welcome the press as a partner in the ultimate goal, the protection of our citizens. And we look forward to going with you behind the one-note voices of talk radio and television to truly open the dialogue on how to make our society safer. And we know, by the same token, that working with us can be frustrating, particularly when we can't give you the entire story. But we can work with you to focus on areas where we can have the open discussion, where we can broaden the debate and go beyond the sound bites and the headlines to the real substance of the problems we all face. This symposium is an excellent beginning. I urge you to take advantage of it, to talk not just to people in your own sphere, be it law enforcement, be it community organizing or the press, but to talk to those on the other side of the aisle. Get their perspective. Understand why sometimes things can't be discussed, because together we can find that common ground. I want to thank you for having me here this morning. You have an excellent program ahead of you. I do want to allow some time for questions. So with that, I will close. And thank you again, and see if you guys have, have, want to have a conversation also. The question I have is, you talked about the huge increase in the number of prescription uh, drug deaths. One of the concerns over the last three decades has been the disparity in sentences on drug-related crimes. Are the sentences for those involved in distributing uh, these types of prescription drugs commensurate with uh, the cocaine sentences that you would see resulting in the same kind of impact, deaths, the destruction on families, but or is it just more of a slap on the wrist, like I would assume uh, they might be, because you may be dealing with two different worlds, one more inner city, one more affluent. You know, your question is an excellent one. It goes to the way in which we try and target how to deal with these cases. Certainly, I think there's an argument that the current sentencing structure for prohibited narcotics may not be the most rational. In fact, I think we were fortunate enough to get a rebalancing of the crack cocaine disparity earlier in this administration. This administration had, had, had hoped for a more even handling of it, but it was not to be politically. Um, so I'm not sure whether you want to say you want prescription drug sentences to rise to the mandatory minimum levels of cocaine and, and heroin trafficking. I, I don't hear you saying that. Um, but in terms of how are they dealt with, it really depends upon the nature of the offense. When we look at the cases federally, we try and target those who are dispensing the drugs. We try and target the medical professionals, particularly those who are knowingly and with warning abusing their license and are dealing and are dealing these drugs. And from there, it really is a matter of the guidelines calculations and sometimes the amount of money that they made. I will tell you, however, that where we can show that the, dis the dispensing um, activities of medical professionals resulted in a drug overdose death, we have charged that death most recently in, in the case on Long Island where we did have that information. So for us, it's a matter of focusing on the cases that have the most impact. If a medical professional is distributing prescription drugs, again, these are prescriptions that are literally left under the doorstep, you know, dispensed with no medical examination at all, dispensed to people who say, gosh, my addiction is getting out of control. 
you know, it's, it's those examples. We do seek to punish those medical professionals severely. They don't just lose their license, they are incarcerated. I think the biggest shock for the doctors that we arrested earlier last year in our prescription drug initiative was they were not released on bail because we made the argument that they are a danger to the community. And this is, this is an area that you see in a lot of, of, um, of law enforcement where people always think of a danger to the community as the kid with the gun is gonna run down the street and shoot you. But the person who literally has no clue or no acceptance that by abusing their license, they are also peddling in death is just as dangerous. And, and we have to treat people evenly in that regard as well. Uh, Daniel Denver at the Philadelphia City Paper. Hi, Dan. Hi, thank you for uh, being here. Um, a major feature of national security prosecutions in recent years have uh, been these things where suspects have uh, um, helped, undercover FBI agents have helped suspects develop plots that arguably they could not have developed without the assistance of other undercover FBI agents, um, which has led to criticism of, of entrapment. Um, is this are these sorts of um, stings and prosecutions um, actually furthering national security, or are they more sort of PR stunts to, to justify large post 9/11 national security budgets? So, Dan, I wish I could I, I wish I could tell you that I had the time and the money and the resources to have my AUSAs do PR, but. Instead, um, I think that where I'd have to, to draw issue with you is, is your description that these are defendants who arguably could not carry out these plots without law enforcement assistance. What we do, and I think this is actually a, a, a problem on both sides of the fence, both in the press and in law enforcement. I'm not sure that we've done the best job of conveying how these cases come together, in large part because this is an area where it's hard for us to have that open discussion. A lot of it's classified. A lot of it is based upon working with the intelligence community, working with the military community, and we simply are not able to discuss the evidence that we have, that we see, that lets us know that this person comes to this country with the intent to target either an institution or a place. Um, but we do have those efforts in place. And so I think sometimes the press starts the story at the ending. You know, we pick up somebody and you see the efforts that we have on tape, you see the conversations that we've been able to capture, which we do to show that person's state of mind and intent, and you think it starts there. And that's understandable, but I can tell you it never does. I'm not able to target someone without the kind of probable cause that comes from evidence that they have their own independent view and that this is what they want to do. It's really not very different from when I was a young narcotics prosecutor working with undercover agents and informants, and defendants would say, well, I was entrapped. I would never have delivered those 100 tons of cocaine but for the government giving me that truck. But for that, I'd have been home. And what we in law enforcement work to show is that that particular defendant or anyone who raises that argument is predisposed either through prior conduct or through them seeking out the activity. It's, it's, it's a very similar analysis. Um, and so I, I understand why people look at those cases and they say, would this have happened but for law enforcement ginning it up, so to speak. But I can tell you, when someone is on tape talking about how their goal in life is to become, become a suicide bomber, and these, these are young guys still. I mean, it's, if you're 21 years old and your goal in life is to die and take others with you, it's, it's chilling, it's, it's a tragedy on many levels, and my job is to stop it. But I can't stop free speech. I have to see what are they inclined to do. So I have to let them display their own intent. And what you will see, certainly in the cases that have been brought in the New York area, and I will point you to uh, the recent case involving the young man who sought to blow up the Federal Reserve Building uh, last fall, was an individual who was given every opportunity to step away from that crime, was asked on several occasions, are you sure this is what you want to do? And that's the practice that we follow in those cases because even if the person were to say, you know what, I've changed my mind, fine, I lose the prosecution, but maybe we backed someone off of this event. And instead, you know, we see defendants who not only say, yes, I'm sure, but in the absence of government informants being with them, will make their own plans. So you do have to focus very carefully on what you hear. There's a lot of chatter out there. 
um, in the intelligence world. And a lot of it is, is, a lot of the work gets done before it ever sees the light of day in terms of winning, winnowing out those who are just talking, who are just venting, who are just upset, who are just young and disaffected as everybody has been in their lives. And everyone says things, but separating those from the ones who are seeking to take steps and who do take steps to carry things out. The young man who sought to blow up the Federal Reserve Building was looking for explosive parts on his own and would have found them but for law enforcement intercepting him. Again, it's very similar to other types of undercover cases that we do. We recently had an undercover case where um, someone who has been convicted of a crime we recently charged him with conspiring to, to, uh, to murder the judge and the prosecutor on his case. He was actively seeking someone to carry out this crime, and but for law enforcement intercepting that, would have taken significant steps to that. Does it arguably have a deterrent effect as well if someone doesn't know if their accomplices are actually undercover agents? You know, I think the, the deterrent effect of the things that we do is hard to measure. We hope that it does. Um, that's one of the reasons why we try and work with the press and tell as much of the story as we can. Um, but what you find is, particularly when people become zealous um, about something, is that they, they, they get this tunnel vision. Um, and so we hope it's a deterrent effect. Uh, in some of the plots that we have seen, uh, in the middle of the plot, when the defendants have thought that they were under surveillance, they have sought to abandon parts of the plot or modify parts of the plot. The case involving the young men who were seeking to blow up the New York City subway system in, back in, in 2009 was one such case. They were literally driving across the bridge with the bomb components in the trunk of the car. The defendant thought he was being followed by law enforcement and decided to dump those bomb components. So that's an area where, fine, if that gets you to stop, great. Um, but others of his, of his uh, group tried to carry out uh, a suicide attack later on. So it's hard to say the deterrent effect that, that it has, um, but it's one of the tools that we do use. And I think, again, that's, the, that's I understand what you say. You know, it looks like we're ginning it up and this, that, and the other. You know, I, I, wish, I, I will say that I have a tremendous amount of respect for the press, having at one point thought to become a journalist myself. But I really do want you guys to focus on going beyond the easy answer. I mean, you all are the best and the brightest at what you do. You know this area, you know the people, you have people you can call, you can talk to to find out, and yet we see this sort of, when it comes to certain types of stories, here's the story. Up oh, another sting case, it must be entrapment. That's sort of lazy reporting in my view, so that's, I'll leave that at that. Thanks. Uh, I'm Ernie Drucker here with John Jay. Morning, Ernie. Uh, the issue of drugs drug laws, drug policies, drug enforcement, national security and drugs, as you bring up, is really huge. And uh, we see the beginnings of changes in drug law and drug policy in this country and things like medical marijuana and the legalization of marijuana by two states. And suddenly the federal, uh, the federal offices are, are in a, some kind of conflict about that. And can you give us any insight into what that discussion is like within your circles uh, in the federal government about um, uh, changing the, every, I think almost everyone agrees that drugs should be treated, they're a public health problem, mm -hmm. that criminalization makes things worse in many ways, the prison population could be explained in many ways by changes in drug policies. So what's that discussion like with the people you talk to? Well, what I can tell you is I, I can't, I, I certainly don't know what's being said in all the circles there, but I can, in terms of what the U.S. attorney community is talking about, there's a recognition that there's a tension there and that there's a very real desire um, not to criminalize people who are truly sick and that there is a very real understanding that states have the responsibility and the right and the ability to make their own decisions about these. The tension comes when you look at where the source of this treatment comes from and at the opposite end of that continuum, because it still includes the recreational use, for example, of marijuana, um, where, because it still includes that re recreational use and abuse, you see the large-scale traffickers and the violence and the large-scale amounts of money that are funneled all the way at the other end. And so there is a tension there, and, I, and you're right, it has not been resolved. I don't know what that resolution will be, 
but it is something that people are, are, are truly struggling with. There's not a desire, as I said, to take the person who is ill, um, and, and there are people who are seriously ill who are helped by this. And I think both the Deputy Attorney General and the Attorney General and even the President have said that those are not the focus of our, of our narcotics strategy. But where people are shipping in literally tons of marijuana via speedboats up and down the East Coast or on the West Coast, and they use, you know, frankly, high-powered assault wef weapons and other weapons of violence to protect that, and they, and they indiscriminately kill people in their way, that's an unacceptable part of the risk. So the tension is, how do we, how do we manage those? And I can tell you that it hasn't been answered yet, but the discussions are ongoing. Um, I'm really interested in racial disparity in criminal justice at the policy level, um, and I wanted to know what your thoughts were on stop and frisk. At the policy level? You know, I think it depends on, again, where you are. I think New York has been sort of a laboratory of that issue in recent years, and this goes back to my first time around in office, and when I was a young prosecutor in the 90s, it was a huge issue. Um, and I think you know, it can be used, it can be misused. It's a tool, like anything else. Um, and I think that a lot, it's, it's unfortunate that it is so different in so many different cities. It almost depends upon who is using it as a tool. I think people, I hate to sound old, but um, things have significantly changed since the 90s and early 2000s when there was a different administration in the city and a different view of policing in the city. It doesn't mean that they're 100% better in terms of how stop and frisk is used. Um, and I think that there's always sometimes the, uh, the tendency in law enforcement when something works to say, okay, we're gonna put all of our effort into that. And sometimes there's thought behind that and the reality is sometimes there's not. You know, I mean, if you, I think it, the, the statistics clearly show that in terms of who gets stopped, again, using New York City as a laboratory, it's going to be young men, it's gonna be minority men. African American, Hispanic, um, but you know, do you, seriously, do, are there people sitting at one PP saying, "Let's stop all the young black men in the city"? No, they don't say that. What they say is, "Let's increase efforts here. Let's intensify efforts there." And do they always think through the consequences of that? Some people do, and some people don't. And then you have people who are literally on the ground, who are working in those communities, the precinct commanders who have a, an understanding of those communities, who have been able to reduce stop and frisk in those areas. So it really is, it's a tool that can be used like any other. Um, and I think that you know, you, what you wanna have though is you wanna have that discussion. You wanna raise those issues, the racial disparities, not just in stop and frisk, but in terms of sentencing, in terms of, of narcotics policy, in terms of who gets prosecuted, in terms of how they get prosecuted, who gets the breaks. You know, if you have similarly situated defendants and I'm deciding or setting up a policy and how do I resolve those cases, how do I plead them out, you know, making sure that that's even handed across the board. And it's something that is a responsibility for everyone in law enforcement to stay on top of. You know, there's, there's, you can set up, you can set all the policies you want in place, but without having that dialogue at the higher levels, it's hard to implement it and push it down. And one of the benefits I can say of working certainly with this current attorney general, whom I worked with years ago when he was the deputy attorney general, and he was really pushing to get the crack cocaine disparities resolved even then, is that those are the types of discussions that we have. Um, um, you mentioned that you're still seeing many, many gang members um, despite the crime job. And you mentioned that you're seeing an increasing number of female gang members. I was wondering why you think that is. Well, actually, I have to tell you, I've always seen it. When I was a young prosecutor in the 90s and I prosecuted Asian organized crime, the, a lot of the a Asian street gangs would have sort of sister organizations or you know, women or young girls who would quote unquote run beside them. Um, and so it's actually always been there. I think now we're just seeing young girls get more and more violent. Um, they're equally as violent as, as the men. Um, there's really very little difference uh, and I think it's the same thing. I think that there are young people who feel disaffected and they choose this as their family. That is probably the most common thread in all the gang members that we talk to, that sense of belonging, that, that connection that they choose to, to, uh, to find there. Um, and I don't mean to make it simplistic, I really don't, because of course there's all, all kinds of factors there. 
Um, but the rise of, of violence in young girls in particular is very disturbing. Although anyone who's been to junior high school knows that the potential is always there. So it's, uh, it's always been gone for the home running, but it's uh, really always great to have a public figure who gives us thoughtful and uh, detailed replies. We really appreciate that. Uh, but please join me in thanking uh, the other one. Uh, we want to 